All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our part two of our survey, Historic Resource Survey Webinar Month, um, Community Survey, How to Successfully Plan and Complete um, a Survey of Historic Community Resources. Slide. All right, so today we're using Zoom, um, and I just wanna go over a few things briefly. We're all getting very familiar with this platform. Um, but if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box as you think of them throughout the presentation. We are saving time at the end um, to, to answer all those questions that may come in. Um, if it's something relevant on the slide, uh, we'll be uh, briefly interjecting those questions as, as, um, as time allows. Um, and to access your Q&A box, if you might need to wiggle your mouse so your uh, Zoom bar will either pop up from the bottom or the top and you can type those in. Um, the chat box will contain any links that may come up during the webinar. So take, be sure to take a peek at that. And we do have one poll that we will start at the beginning. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a link to the recording that, are, that is housed on our YouTube channel. So thank you again for joining us today and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Right. All right, so again, today we are here discussing community surveys, um, how to successfully plan and complete a survey of historic community resources. Um, sometimes this is a very daunting task. Uh, you don't know where to start if you're looking at um, several blocks of buildings. There's a lot of properties. How do you organize things? Um, do you use volunteers? Do you use a consultant? There's a lot of things to think about, but if uh, we plan uh, beforehand, we can execute these community resource surveys um, and get that information so we can have a good community planning um, regarding our historic resources. So I am going to, um, well, slide first. We'll, we'll do the poll in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Uh, so first of all, um, my name is Mallory Bauer, and I have the privilege of serving as the field representative for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Um, we are putting on this webinar in conjunction with the Michigan State Historic Preservation Office. Um, but MHPN, my organization, advocates for Michigan's historic places that contribute to our economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We are a statewide nonprofit, and we cannot do the work that we do without our members and volunteers. Um, if you are a member, thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in joining our mission, um, please go to www.mhpn.org today to become a member slide. Uh, additionally, these webinar series that we have been doing since April are supported through um, the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. So we want to thank them for their support in bringing, helping us bring this information to you. All right, and we will pause now for our poll um, before I introduce um, our presenter today. And it's just one question, and this will help us uh, reserve time later on in the presentation. Um, so we're mostly looking at, is your community looking to conduct a survey using a consultant or using a volunteer effort? Um, so I'll make sure after you click your selection that you hit submit, otherwise it doesn't come through. All right, so I'm going to end this poll. Thank you for those who participated. And so it looks like the majority of those attending are looking at either a volunteer effort or they're unsure of how they're going to conduct a, a survey. So hopefully that is helpful for us. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Katie Kolakithis of the State Historic Preservation Office. She is their survey coordinator, and we are so grateful to have her here today to share her um, expertise and experience with us. So take it away, Katie. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, happy to be here. Hopefully uh, we have some of our people that, that joined us on our previous webinar, but welcome if you are new. Um, 
feel free to check out the recording, as Mallory said, of the previous one. Um, there's some good info in there on kind of the introduction of what survey is and can be for your community. Um, I am going to do a quick recap just in case there are new people um, and just to remind you of what we're talking about today. Um, so historic resource survey is the process for identifying and gathering information on a community's historic resources. Um, there's really two main types, archaeological survey and architectural, architectural or above ground survey. We're only talking about architectural or above ground survey today. If you have questions on archaeological survey, feel free to reach out to Stacy Torzinski in the SHPO office and she'll be happy to help you uh, handle anything that you need for archaeological survey. Um, and so then just as a reminder, there are two main types of architectural survey, reconnaissance level and intensive level. Um, as you may remember, reconnaissance level is a first look to assess um, what's there and its condition and integrity. Um, you're not doing any deep uh, dive into the history. You provide an architectural description, photographs, um, and then you provide a, a history and a context of the community and the, or the survey area itself. Intensive level survey is the is the survey that involves um, individual property histories for each property. So just as a in a very basic way. Uh, we did talk a little bit about planning the survey the last time. But we're going to get into a little bit more of, of how to do that today. Um, the first thing that you really, really have to look at is your purpose. Why are you doing this? What, what do you hope to get out of this? What do other members of your community hope to get out of this? Um, very rarely does a, surface, does a survey only have one purpose. Um, then you wanna look at your methodology. What to survey? How are you gonna survey? Um, is it gonna be a thematic survey? Is it gonna be a neighborhood survey? Is it a survey that's driven by a compliance project or a grant project? Um, and then you wanna think about what physically the ages of the properties that you're gonna survey. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The other big question, and, and we get this a lot, is whether you're gonna engage a, a federally qualified architectural historian or whether you're going to work on a volunteer driven survey. So we will talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about how to hire a consultant and, and what to look for and what resources um, SHPO can provide to assist with that. And then we'll talk a little bit about volunteer driven surveys. Uh, and how that works and some of the challenges and things to watch out for um, on that. So this, this survey purpose, we've talked a lot about this over the course of the last webinar and this one, but um, this really is gonna depend on your individual community and what you need. Um, I think we did talk about the example from Kalamazoo the other day where Kalamazoo is working on a, a reconnaissance level survey of their whole entire community which is a massive undertaking, but they're also tying in other city departments that want to know things or need to know things about, about some of these properties and the streets and that sort of thing. So trying to figure out what your community needs is a really uh, beneficial way to kind of help guide your purpose. Um, and compliance surveys are gonna have a very, very different purpose and need than a, a community survey is. So compliance projects would be, um, for example, not to pick on, MDOT or roads, but if MDOT or a local road agency is working on a, a federally funded project, they're going to have to come through and do a, potentially, if, if there's something there, they're going to have to come through and do an architectural survey um, to determine what's there and whether or not that's going to be impacted by the project that they're doing. So that's going to have a very small footprint that, that is dependent on the project that they're doing, um, whereas a community survey could be a neighborhood, could be um, just a street, it could be a couple of houses, or it could be in the entire community, like the, like the uh, example I gave a minute ago. So it really is gonna depend on all of those factors. So a few things that you're gonna wanna establish for your methodology. You're gonna wanna set out your goals and priorities. You're gonna wanna look at your survey area. Um, you're gonna wanna do some, some pre-research about how to tackle your survey area. Depending on the size of your survey area, um, it, it will help with field work if you can strategically figure out how to um, go out and do your survey in a, in a way that will maximize your time and um, also allow you to get good photographs. For example, uh, we did talk a lot about photographs in the last webinar and we talked a lot about 
sun and light and how difficult it can be to get photos. A lot of times surveyors will go out and they will photograph one side of a street when the sun is right on that side of the street. Then they will go photograph the back side of another of, of that of the opposite side of the street. And then in the afternoon when the sun shifts, they'll go do the other side of the street and the other side. But, but thinking about these things uh, ahead of time will really help you save time and, and hopefully prevent you from having to go back out multiple times. Um, you're gonna wanna look at your methods to be used. Where are you gonna do research? What research is already available? Um, what types of archives are you gonna are you gonna go to? Are there newspapers? Are there county histories? Are there photographs? Um, you're gonna want to try to figure all that out ahead of time so that you can plan how much time is that going to take? Who's going to do that in a volunteer-led survey? And then um, figuring out in what order to do that. Do you think that you want to do that before you go out and do your field work? Do you want to do that after you do your field work? There, there's no 100% right way to do that. Um, it's, it's in my experience, it's kind of a personal preference thing. There are, there are benefits to doing your archival research before your field work, and there are benefits to doing your field work before your archival research. It just depends on the timing. Um, if you are going to use a team of volunteers, you need to establish your team. You're going to want to figure out um, whether the folks that you can find are committed. Do you have enough people? Um, do they understand what they're looking for and what they're looking at? So you're going to have to, to establish your, your team of volunteers. And then you're going to want to figure out what kind of documentation you're going to be producing out of this. Are you going to be doing an intensive level survey? Are you going to be doing a reconnaissance level survey? Um, and then are you sending that to SHPO? Are you doing this for, for example, a local historic district survey um, ahead of a study committee report? Those we are, as Amy mentioned, Amy Arnold from my office mentioned in the previous webinar, we are asking that the survey itself get submitted um, to our office for review uh, for local district reports. So you need to figure out what is what your final product is going to be because that will help you figure out how to get there. Um, you also need to look at your time frame. Uh, we did talk a little bit about timing last time in terms of photographs because you know the middle of a blizzard is not the right time to take a photograph of a historic property. Same thing with a rainstorm or the middle of summer when when trees are fully leafed out. So you need to pay attention to the timing of that so that you can try to get the best photographs that you can. Because when we're looking at a survey, the only thing that I have to go on is the description in the survey. I can't go out to every property that I look at. Um, so those photographs need to be able to demonstrate to me what's going on with this property. So those are really, really important. Um, you also need to think about how long this potentially will take. On a consultant driven project, you're depending on their capacity, you're likely looking at a shorter time frame than you will on a volunteer led survey, um, simply because that person is getting paid to do this in a certain time frame. Um, whereas volunteer efforts tend to kind of lag and, and you know, people have waning interest in a project or, or, or time um, to be able to dedicate to it. So you're gonna wanna think about when do we need to have this done and what's our best option for getting that to happen. Um, the other thing to, to think about before you start your project is, is start, is you need to start thinking about which historic contexts are going to be investigated. I listed a few here. This is not a uh, comprehensive list. This is just a few. Um, are you going to, are you in a logging area where there's logging camps? Are you on a farm and you're looking at farmsteads and farm outbuildings? Um, like our project in Detroit that we uh, have been working on, we, we have done a civil rights survey in Detroit. Um, it just is going to depend on the, the individual properties that you're looking at and, and the community. So make sure that you understand what you're looking for and what, uh, what you're going to have to be doing research on. The next thing that this is probably the most, uh, the question that we get the most is, do we have money for, to help people with surveys? Um, we, in general, do not when the, the grant money that we have available is for what are called certified local governments, CLGs, you'll hear us talk about that a lot. Um, and certified lo local governments are eligible for grants for survey and designation projects, as well as physical construction projects. Um, that is 
uh, that is a national program that, that is administered at, at the state level by Alan Higgins in our office. Um, he did a webinar earlier this summer that I think is also up on the up on MHPN's website, so you can um, check that out if you're interested. There are about 30, I think we're up to 32 communities in Michigan that, that have this status, and they can, um, they can apply for these grants on an annual basis. They're two-year grant cycles, um, so we, the, the call for applications for CLGs for their grant projects for the next fiscal year, I think they're due October 1st. So um, we are talking to communities right now about their, their projects, uh, and there are survey projects that are in the mix. Um, it's a good way for these CLGs to get survey work done um, in a timely-ish manner because of the two-year grant cycle. Um, there are grants out there available for other and from other entities, uh, for example, the National Park Service. Um, sometimes the National Trust will fund things. Local um, Michigan-based uh, nonprofits will also occasionally have grants that can be used for survey or designation projects. Uh, for example, the city of Detroit was able to get a National Park Service civil rights grant to do a survey of a um, African-American neighborhood. I I, they're, I think they're underway with that project, if I remember from my last update on that one. Um, the other way to do it is to have it privately funded through your community. Um, we have had communities that have used their community foundation or others to be able to fund a consultant-driven um, survey. And then the other way is to have the city uh, budget or city or county budget in uh, funding for that survey. Given all of the craziness that is our current uh, situation with COVID, I, I would guess that municipally funded surveys are probably going to not happen for a couple of years. Um, but hey, maybe I'll be surprised. So if you're going to fund your survey, that means that you're going to hire a consultant. So the consultants that we're looking at are folks that meet the Secretary of the Interior's professional qualification standards for one of these five categories, depending on what you're doing. Realistically, for architectural survey, we're looking for architectural historians. Those are folks that have a history and a background in architecture history, uh, American history, and they understand how to write building descriptions. They understand about architectural styles. Um, they, have, they have a lot of background in those types of things that are key for architectural surveys. Um, obviously, archaeologists would be used by folks using the archaeological survey. Um, historians, oftentimes you will find consultants that are architectural historians and historians, and it just means that they have additional background in American history. Um, historic architects are licensed architects that work on historic buildings. So we often get people that get those, the, the architectural historian and historic architect um, confused. Historic architects are not generally qualified to work on an architectural survey because they are an, arch they are, they are an architect. They don't have the background in architecture history um, that an architectural historian will have. Lots of words throwing around in there. And then the final one is a preservation planner. This can be useful as well while you're working on an architectural survey um, because you can use that survey as a planning document and, and have planning recommendations and that sort of thing in there as well. But generally, we're looking for architectural historians. Um, SHPO does have a qualified consultants list, um, and I will, I was going to try to pull up our website and show you. Let me see if this will work. Well, hopefully, this is working. Um, you should be able to see my screen, hopefully. Mallory, let me know if it's not working. Um, and this is our website, and you can go down. There's a research resources button down here. Researcher and consultant resources. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff for consultants. There's scheduling a research appointment. There's our lists. Uh, there's the historic architect list we talked about. Then there's the architectural historian, archaeologist, and, and historian list. And this is the one that you're going to want to look at. Um, so it's about 16 pages long. I'm due for an update. I have to update it, uh, but, but it'll be in the same place. So you can find it if you need it. So there's where that is. Okay. So in order to select a consultant, there's some work that has to be done before you can get to the point where you get a bid from a consultant. 
um, you first need to figure out what your project is. You need to figure out how many buildings, you need to figure out your time frame. you need to figure out what level of survey you're gonna be looking at. Um, there's kind of a lot of, of information that you're gonna to need to collect ahead of time. You're also gonna to wanna to then identify consultants to contact. That list that I showed you is not every single consultant that can, that can work in Michigan. Anybody that meets the federal qualifications can work on an architectural survey. Um, the, that list is just a courtesy that we provide that it, it's just kind of a compiled list of folks that have indicated that they are seeking work in this area. Um, so you can feel free to contact people that are not on the list. You can use the list however you want to, um, to find somebody. Um, there are a lot of consultants in our state. I think there's about 68 architectural historians and historians on that part of the list. Uh, and they are all over the whole entire state. There's also folks from out of state. Don't be afraid to contact them. Um, preservation consultants are very used to traveling. So don't be afraid to contact somebody, especially for example, if you're in the UP and, and there are firms that are in Wisconsin, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to them because they will be more than happy to, to help you. Um, you can use the, the information that you have to request quotes and information on their qualifications. Um, you're going to get a variety of quotes for every project. Every consultant seems to have, you know, everyone has different overheads. They have different pricing structures. It's just going to depend on the individual firm. Um, this is probably the second most asked question I get is, well, how much is this going to cost me? There's no way for me to tell you that because I don't, number one, I don't know everything about your project. And number two, every consultant is going to be a little bit different. So you really need to go through and request quotes from from several, we recommend asking several different consultants for quotes. Um, and then you need to evaluate and select your consultant. So we'll talk about that in a second. So, and we, we Alan Higgins, our CLG coordinator that I mentioned earlier, has put together a document about selecting a preservation consultant that will hopefully be on our website pretty soon. Um, but this, we, we kind of, all of this is based on his form that he put out. So hopefully that will help communities that um, are looking at hiring someone. You're looking at multiple things. You wanna know, are they competent? Do they meet the professional standards? Do they demonstrate project knowledge and understanding of, of what's, what's needed for this particular project? What's their experience with similar projects or similar resources? Sometimes you may have a project that has very specific uh, a, a very specific type of resource. And, and if your consultant isn't familiar with that, then it can really make your project challenging. One example would be uh, if you have a really complex modern neighborhood that um, has, a, has a variety of architectural styles from the modern movement in them, you wanna make sure that whoever you are gonna hire is, is comfortable with modern resources and modern architectural styles because they, that can be a, a bit of a challenge sometimes. There's not a lot of good guidance out there for consultants. So you wanna find somebody that's, that is familiar with it. Do they have any special skills or expertise that will help your project? Uh, those are all the kinds of questions that you wanna look at when, you're, when you are looking at competence. Um, compatibility, how will the consultant approach the project? Everybody has a little bit different way of approaching projects. Will that work for your community? Um, what's their management style? What's their communication style? Do they like to talk on the phone? Do they email? Do they ignore your emails for six months and then, oh yeah, I've been working on this this whole time. Um, make sure, making sure that your communication style and management style matches up with um, the consultant will be important. Um, what's the plan for keeping you informed of their progress? Are there going to be review periods? Um, establishing all of these kinds of things is very important. Um, and then also knowing how they're, they're going to deal with setbacks or delays or other problems that arise. I can tell you right now that we have, sorry, very loud car outside my house. Um, I can tell you right now that we have, I think, three surveys that are going on right now that have obviously been significantly impacted by COVID um, because two, at least two of them involve oral history or, or working directly with a community uh, group. And obviously that's fairly difficult when you need to socially distance and, and all of the, the things that we do these days to keep ourselves safe. So um, those consultants have all had to kind of roll with the punches and figure out how to get their work done 
um, but still keeping themselves and, and their, the, the members of the community that they're working with safe. So uh, lots of setbacks uh, and delays the last few months. You also wanna look at their performance histories. This is where you can ask for references and you can ask for, um, you wanna you want to talk to past clients and figure out if they were satisfied with their work. Did they meet their deadlines? Did they stay in budget? Um, were there communication issues? These are the kinds of questions that you're going to want to ask. And then finally, you're gonna to wanna to look at the cost and the timeline. How quickly can the consultants start? What's their staffing? Do they have sufficient staffing for your particular project? Um, have they accounted for all of your, your project activities that, that you've asked for in their schedule? And then does the cost seem reasonable and sufficient to cover what you, what you need? But what happens when you can't fund a consultant-driven project? Don't panic. Um, there are some other options. And there are challenges to those other options, just like there are some challenges with consultant-driven projects, but we will we'll help you along the way. So volunteer-led surveys work best when there is a federally qualified architectural historian or historian that can supervise. Um, for some communities in Michigan, that will be the staff person in the community. There are a handful that have either a preservation planner or architectural historians or historians that, that work in the city and can kind of help. Um, also, a lot of times we'll see them on historic district commissions and they can, they can assist um, through their role on the historic dist district commission. Uh, the other thing that you're gonna need to concentrate on is training. How are you gonna get these folks trained and, and up to speed on everything that they need to know to be able to go out to the field, take the notes that you need them to take, bring it back and figure out how to uh, best present that information. The other thing to think about too is timing. In my experience, volunteer-led surveys take a lot more time than consultant-driven surveys like we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, it can be really hard to get a group of, especially for a large project, it can be really hard to get a group of 25, people, which may be what you need to get it done in any kind of timely fashion, um, to be committed for a long-term project like that. Uh, we do see communities that have, you know, five, five or eight people, um, depending on the size of whatever they're surveying, that can work. It's just you need to have at least a few that are committed and will continue to, um, we'll, we'll see the project through. The other problem too is that without consistency of, of volunteers, then you're looking at having to continually train new folks to bring them in and have them help you. Um, this can also be problematic because everyone, every single one of us looks at things a little bit different. So what may look like poor condition to me may look like moderate condition to someone else. So it, it can be really difficult when you don't have consistency to a uh, volunteers to be able to do a, um, a survey. So are there questions, before we go on to the next section, are there questions on volunteer-led surveys or consultant surveys? Because then we're going to kind of get into the nitty gritty of like filling out forms and that sort of thing. Katie, you kind of um, touched on, on this a little bit with staff, but a question came in, might it be a good use of limited funding to have a consultant set up the survey do quality control over photography, interpret the findings, and write the expected reports while having the volunteers, after training, conduct the time-consuming photographic work on the street? So the challenge with that is that most consultants are not going to be willing to work with a volunteer group. There are some that will, but most will not because the challenge is that they, their name is going to ultimately end up on, on whatever document is produced. And when there isn't, when they're not the ones doing the work, many of them will not want to have, will not want to be associated with a given project because they won't want to risk the fact that, you know, maybe we work on, maybe we have, you know, three great volunteers and two that were really bad. Um, so that could be, yeah, and then for like SHPO funded projects, we have decided, we have kind of come to the um, opinion that, that having volunteers work on our projects that we're funding specifically through like CLGs 
does not generally work out very well. It's really hard to track and keep track of all of their hours and, and quantify that. Um, and, and again, the, the issue of a consultant not wanting a volunteer in on the, in on the um, yeah, quality control issues with a consultant versus the volunteer. So I think that's, that's generally the challenge. I think you will probably find consultants that may be interested in doing something like that, particularly if it's in, for example, their community and they really want to help out, but um, they still deserve to get paid for their hard work. I think that that could be a good use of, of things, but my guess is that it, it's, it would be a little bit challenging to find that. Um, the other thing that we didn't talk about that I meant to mention was that you can also reach out to some of the graduate programs in the state of Michigan uh, and talk to folks. A lot of times the professors or students are looking for projects that they need to work on to complete their master's degree. Um, we have surveys that happen that way occasionally. We also have national register nominations that happen that way. Uh, like when I was getting my master's degree, uh, that was my final project was to complete a national register nomination for a house in Grass Lake, Michigan. So that's another good opportunity. It, if you're looking for something to just get done at some point in time, that's a good option. If you need something done in a timely manner, that's not likely to be a good option. Uh, for example, I graduated in 20, oh geez, no, I'm not going to remember, 2013. And I didn't, my property that I worked on didn't get officially listed until 2017 because life. <laughs> so if, if you're looking for just something to be done at some point in time, that could be a really great option. Um, if you are, if you really have a timing crunch, that's not going to be your, your good option. Anything else? Okay. Nope, that was the only one that's come in thus far. Okay. So we're going to go into the forms a little bit and hold on a minute while I try to switch over to a different screen. There we go. Um, so we have a variety of forms for filling out and completing your surveys. Um, we have created three at this point, at this moment in time, we have three different forms. Um, we have an architectural district and complex form. That's the one that you see on the screen right now. We have one for architectural properties. So buildings, um, structures, objects, that sort of thing. And then we have a separate one for cultural landscapes. So things like parks or uh, I believe cemeteries can go on that or um, sometimes uh, like designed landscapes and that sort of thing. So those are the three forms that we have. Um, real quick, I will show you where they are on our website. Anytime you're looking for our website, if you just search michigan.gov slash SHPO, it will pull you up to our website. And we're gonna go back to that research resources section and then there's an identification forms library. This is where the most current versions of the forms are always gonna live. So if you're starting a new survey, always come here, get the newest form because we do update them occasionally. Um, and these are Word documents that you can fill and expand. I, what I'm gonna show you when we're looking through them are PDFs. I only PDF them to make them easier to look at on or to scroll through as I'm showing you all. But these are fillable Word documents. Feel free to insert photos, to insert historic maps, whatever you want in them. They, they can expand to be, you know, I've gotten some that are 27 pages long. Um, they can expand to be however big or small you need them to be. So that's where they are on our website. Um, but I'm gonna walk you through the forms a little bit. I'm actually gonna go down, of course, the other one. I should have checked the order. There we go. So the, the most basic and the most commonly used one is gonna be this architectural properties identification form. Um, for the most part, this first page is going to be pretty basic information about each property. Um, you're going to fill in the address, the city, the, the state, the township, whatever information you have. The county, uh, if you want to put a, a parcel number on, sometimes um, cities and communities like to track things for, by parcel number. That doesn't mean, it doesn't mean anything for us, but if that's something that's useful for you or for your community to track, feel free to do that. Um, the things that we definitely need, we need a latitude and a longitude. If you need help with that, you can generally um, 
get some of that online. Um, if you need help with that, go ahead and contact us and we'll help you figure out how to, how to best get that information for us. Um, we also need to know or want to know whether or not this is a privately owned structure, or is it owned by a state or state or federal government, what, who owns it. Um, and then you're going to select what kind of building you have, commercial, residential, other. Um, if you want to write in, you could type in other or what, you know, whatever it is. Um, if this is a structure, an object, you just check those boxes. These are all fairly easy check boxes. Um, you can insert a photograph here. It doesn't have to remain this size. You can resize it if you need to. Um, we just need to be able to see what it is. Um, then you're going to enter in some really basic architectural information like the construction date, style, building form. So that means is it a is it an American four square? Is it an I-shaped house? Is it a gable front? Um, you're just going to look at kind of the shape of the building. Then you're going to look at the roof form. Uh, you're going to look at roof materials, wall materials, foundation materials, window materials. It can be really, really difficult for us in our office to be able to tell what on earth materials a particular building is. Uh, so telling us really helps us out. And it also helps us when we're doing data entry on our side to be able to get these properties into our computer database. Um, if there are outbuildings, you know, obviously you check the yes box and then just type in what it is. Is it a barn? Is it a garage? Is it a chicken coop? Whatever that may be. Um, and then we're gonna get into the eligibility. And this is where a volunteer-led survey is going to struggle a little bit because architectural historians know how to assess National Register eligibility. We did talk a little bit about this the last webinar, um, what the different criteria mean, but basically we're looking at is this property important in, in history to related to social history, a movement of some kind, uh, important people, a significant architecture or additional or, or, or the potential to yield information, which is D. Um, the National Register process, the, these, the eligibility follows that very, very closely. So if you're unsure, looking up those National Register bulletins that we included in the uh, one page form after, or one page sheet after the uh, previous webinar will really help you because those bulletins will walk you through what all of this means. So what the criteria considerations are, what the um, areas of significance are, what the periods of significance, what all of that is. This, this will very much walk you through that. Um, you're gonna wanna select, if you believe the property is eligible under one of these criteria, then you are gonna select that box. Uh, if it's part of a district, you type the district name here um, you, and you select that it's contributing or non-contributing to a district. Um, there's an integrity assessment. Again, we talked about that. Oh, sorry, my cat's falling off the window. <laughs> um, there are integrity assessments, um, historic name, common name. If you know the original owner or historic owner, like a long time owner, that can be added here. Um, the historic building use, current building use. If you, if you don't know any of these things, it's okay to write unknown. Um, and then you're gonna wanna write who surveyed it, when, if we've given you a report number, that can go here. Otherwise, we'll write it in after we process the report um, in our office. And then this box is for us. So then the second page of this form is the one that can expand. Um, they, these boxes will get as big as you need them to get. They can go across multiple pages. Um, but what you're going to do is write an architectural description in this one. You're going to write the history of the resource here. And then this last one is it a statement of significance or recommendation of eligibility and then references. Um, especially if you're doing an intensive level survey, don't provide a bunch of history without providing us references because then it just looks kind of suspicious and we're trying to figure out where the heck did all this history come from? Um, so the other thing to know about these forms is that we are going to start using these forms across different program areas. So we've already, I think it should be up on the website already, but the um, National Register for Historic Places preliminary questionnaire that gets submitted to our office for review uh, before you, to determine whether your property is eligible for the National Register so that you can then go and do a nomination is now gonna involve these forms. So if you do a survey and you have this form already and you want to submit something for 
consideration for the National Register, then you can attach this form to the cover sheet that, that we have for the preliminary questionnaires and send that to Todd Walsh, our National Register Coordinator, and he'll be able to review it. Um, we're trying to get a little more consistent across our office so that um, all of our forms kind of look the same and we are collecting good information. Um, so that's why you'll see this form a lot. Um, and our cultural resource consultants will see it in a couple more places as well as they, many of them already know. Um, so that is that form. And generally, we did briefly discuss the last time we were on a webinar about what to do when you're in the field. Um, everybody does this differently. And, and, but for a volunteer-led survey, I do think that it's probably the most useful to have a field note form, which is what I have up on the screen right now. Um, this is going to be the kind of thing that you print off on a big uh, 11 by 17 page. You can make it double-sided and you can just fill out for every property that you're doing. Um, this will make sure that you don't miss anything. Uh, architectural historians will oftentimes use a survey app to collect their information. We did talk about that last time too, um, but there are survey apps out there that you can use to collect the information and take a photograph and, and, and also some of them even take your, your GPS coordinates as well. Um, but if you're using, if you're kind of bare bones doing volunteer work, these are a really great resource to be able to um, know that you're checking every box, that you've looked at everything you've looked at. Oh shoot, I, I forgot to look at the window type. Um, this will kind of help you figure out what you're supposed to look at every single time. Um, it can get a little unwieldy when you've got a large area that you're surveying and you may end up with a lot of these. Um, but and there, there is the potential that, that this could be filled in on a tablet or something like that as well, um, because this is also a Word document that can be typed into. So um, we do, at this moment in time, these are not on the website. Um, they will be, we just have not gotten them up there yet. So if you need one of these and you want me to send it to you an email, feel free to reach out and I'll be happy to send it to you until we get it up on the website. Um, Katie, would you yeah. be would you be open to having us send a copy to everyone who registered for the webinar? For sure. Yeah, for sure. We can do that. Excellent. Um, we did have a, a few questions come in. Do you want to pause sure. for a moment to, to wade through these? Yeah, sure. Um, all right. Um, one question came in. Will you accept circa dates of construction if research doesn't reveal an actual date? And then how about referencing what appears to be generations of construction, so additions, et cetera? Yep. The answer is yes. Um, as anybody knows that's done research on historic buildings, as frustrating as it can be, sometimes you're never going to know exactly when it was built. Um, you can get close sometimes, but you're never going to know unless, unless you find some magical reference um, or you happen to be on a Sanborn map and it says built in. Uh, there are times where you're not gonna know for sure. And yes, absolutely. Um, what we're asking people to do is provide the best information they can at that given point in time. We all acknowledge that sometimes this will change and maybe in five years, someone will have found some sort of, of map or document that, sh that does tell you the construction date of this. So we all understand that, that a lot of our stuff is very fluid. Um, you know, one researcher may be able to find something that somebody else may not, or we may find information that's contradictory. We may find one source that says that this building was built in 1902 and something else that says it was built in 1840. So, uh, and that has happened <laughs> recently. Um, so yes, the short answer to that is absolutely. And then what was the second part? Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. Um, uh, how to reference um, generations of construction, so possibly additions, addition, um, changes to the property over time. Yep, so on this, on this form, that all of that kind of stuff is going to go in your narrative description and your history. So if you know that the, um, that the construction date was, you know, circa 1920, oops, I'm on the wrong one. you can write in circa 1920. Um, but I, so on this one, try to keep it fairly limited on the first page. But the second page, like I said, it's expandable and you can add whatever you want to that. So yes, absolutely. Referencing that is, is just fine. 
All right. So our next question is, do you have a favorite style guide for guidance on biblio bibliographic citations? Yes, we do. We use the Chicago manual of style. Um, the most up to date one is the one we generally use. Um, we do also have a style guide on our website for things like numbers and how you reference um, some of those kind of weird quirky things. That's that was completed by our National Register coordinator and um, Mallory. I bet we can find the link to that and provide it to folks as well on the one pager. And if you need help finding it, I can help it. I can help. So. Perfect. Perfect. All right. One more question. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we feel a house would be eligible for the historic district we are trying to form, but we don't have a historic district yet, is a house eligible? And then we are using over 50 years old as a guideline. So I feel like we might need some more information about that. Yeah. We, well, we can kind of go over the basics of that. So the 50 year guideline is a guideline, first of all. Um, there are things that are eligible and listed on the National Register that are younger than 50 years old. Um, so that's a guideline. If, if it is younger than 50 years old, it has to meet a criteria consideration to, to have some exceptional significance to make up for the fact that it's not 50 years old yet. So the 50 year is a good kind of starting point, um, but don't, don't completely write something off because it's not 50 years old yet um just because of that so make sure that 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 that's that it makes sense and there's not some exceptional significance about this particular building um in terms of eligibility technically um shipo staff and and ultimately the keeper of the national register is kind of the official eligible eligible um the keeper of the eligibility determinations i guess you could say so Generally, what happens for a survey is that they are whoever's conducting the survey is providing recommendations of eligibility. So they are they are saying that we believe based on what we know, we believe that this property is or this district is eligible. Um, so then that comes into our office and depending on what it's for myself or one of our other one of our other staff members reviews it and then we either agree or disagree with your eligibility recommendation. Uh, sometimes we will say that we don't have enough information to make an eligibility recommendation, and that's okay. Um, depending on the project, sometimes that means you do have to go back out and do more research and provide us more information, but sometimes it just stays as more information. Um, so, so in terms of historic districts, if a historic district has previously been determined eligible, um, the properties in the district are referred to as contributing and non-contributing. Um, contributing buildings essentially mean that they're an eligible piece of that eligible historic district. So I guess hopefully I'm answering that question right. Um, I don't know. Yeah, if the, um, if the individual who asked that question want, has any other follow-up, please feel free to type that in and we'll address that at the end. Um, one more question came in that I think is helpful as we look at the um, form. Yep. Uh, what is the difference between architectural style and building form? So architectural style is the design of the building, like the, uh, I'm trying to think of a way to describe this for non architectural historians. So the building form, like I said, is mostly about the shape of it. Um, is it a uh, is it a American Foursquare where it's a, where it's a, literally a square? Is it a um, I shaped building? Is it an L shaped building? Is it an upright and wing? Is it a that those are the kinds of things that are are form question like that? That is what the form is. Um, the architectural style is a little tricky because. A lot of, not every, number one, not every building has a style. Um, sometimes they have a form or they, they are a more vernacular building, which means that they were not designed by an architect. Um, architectural styles generally are high style, uh, designed by an architect. So things like Italianate houses and um, Greek Revival and some of these other like really, really distinctive styles 
of, of these houses. So it's, it's about the decorations and the, the, the forms of the roof and the, the windows and that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of good guidance out there about how to, how to describe styles. Um, it, it can, one of the ones that I think is the most user-friendly for the non-professional is the Field Guide to American. I actually have it on my desk right now because we use it a lot. Um, is the Field Guide to American. Is it going to show up with my funky background? Um, this is the, let's see, what year is this one? This is the most recent one. I think it's 2017, um, but it's written by Virginia McAllister, and it covers a huge variety of, of residential architecture. So that can be really helpful, and there's lots of photos and uh, drawings and that sort of thing. And it talks, it does talk about the differences between the forms and the and the common forms of different architectural styles. So for the building form, you're going to be looking primarily at the sh the physical shape of the structure, and then for architectural style, you're going to be looking at that plus all of the other fluff on the outside of the building. If that if that uh, makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and any follow-up questions, feel free to type those in. But um, that's all the questions we have right now, Katie, so I'll let you continue. Okay. Um, I'm going to go over the other forms real quick. So the way that the forms are designed, that architectural properties form that we looked at first, is for individual building structures or objects. If you are in a historic district or you're surveying a historic district, the idea is that you will first fill out an architectural district or complex form, which is the one that we're looking at right now. Um, and then you will fill out one of the uh, individual uh, architectural properties forms for each building. So this form is pretty much going to have the district name, um, a current or common name if it's different than what the, the historic district name should be. Um, we're going to want boundaries from like what streets bound, if that's possible. Sometimes in rural areas, there's no streets. And so just kind of a verbal description of what the boundaries are, um, where it's at, city, state, zip code, county, that sort of thing. Um, we are going to want the acreage of however big that particular district is. And then again, on the ownership, um, same thing on the type as the last one. This form can be used by um, for um, agricultural complexes, so like a farm complex with a house and a barn and, a, and multiple um, agricultural related outbuildings. Again, the intention would be that you fill out this for the whole complex and then you fill out an individual form for each building on the, on the property. Um, so then you're gonna wanna talk about the number of resources, how many of those are contributing or non-contributing, any significant dates, like if you have dates of construction, if you have, um, consi you know, uh, a large, something large or major happened with the district or, or say a farm at any, say in 1920, they changed from, you know, agriculture or uh, crop farming to livestock or something. We want significant dates. Um, for complexes, you're in, in this case, you would just provide a list of the different resources. So it would be a corn crib and a, um, you know, bank barn and some of the different features of that complex. And then we're going to want a map or an aerial photo. And again, you can increase the size of this if that makes it easier. Um, but we do want the boundaries shown on that. Um, and then we go back to that eligibility thing, same sort of thing um, as before. And then you're going to do a description, a history, and the statement of significance. It's the same format as the last form. Um, again, these expand. For a historic district, you are going to fill out this inventory. So you're going to put the street address, city, township, county, your built, contributing, yes or no. Um, so if you have a farm complex, you won't do this last page. You'll add up, you'll add your uh, things back on that first page. But this, this particular, the third page of this is specifically for historic districts. Um, so are there any questions on that form? We did have one come in. If the district is residential with carriage house or other outbuildings, should the complex form be used for each resource? No, in that case, depending on like, for, in some of our, like Michigan has some really, really 
fancy uh, carriage houses in some of our historic districts. Um, you know, uh, Heritage Hill in Grand Rapids comes to mind or some of the other, like in my hometown, um, there's some really, really fancy uh, carriage houses that potentially would be eligible um, or, or, or a contributing resource in the district. So in that case, you would fill out an architectural properties form for the house and, and on that form, you would add that there's a uh, outbuilding. And then, you, and then it's kind of up to you. If, if it's a really, generally you would only put a description of that outbuilding in your type in boxes. You would not necessarily fill out an individual form for that. Um, if you're in a situation where you, you think, hey, these are something, these are not just a standard, you know, your standard garage that was added to the property, you know, simply for the, the cars, these are really something, then call us and talk to us. Let me know what, you, what you're dealing with, how many you've got, you know, we certainly don't want to be unreasonable, but if it makes sense to fill out one of these for that, um, then, then it may make sense in certain situations. But generally, no, you're, you're going to fill out this and just add it, add a garage as an outbuilding. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, while you were answering that one, we had another one come in. Okay. Um, while it will vary per property, how long would you estimate it to take to complete a basic form for a typical property in a residential district? If we're looking at doing something via volunteer effort, it'd be important to have an idea of what commitment we're asking people to make. So that's going to be a little bit of a challenging question to ask because it's going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, the first factor that it's going to depend on is what level of survey you're doing. If you're doing a recon survey uh, where you're just going out and assessing what's physically there, um, it would probably be pretty quick, uh, an hour or two, maybe to go out, take your photos, come back, fill out the form. Um, if you're doing a intensive level survey where there is research involved in the individual property, then you're looking at a significantly higher amount of labor time because each individual property has to be researched. So say, for example, you have 25 buildings in your district and you have five volunteers. Okay, so give each of them um, their set number of properties and it may take them, you know, everybody works at a different pace. And then, and then the other challenge is that everything's available in different, um, some communities, historic resources are very accessible. Some you really have to dig for, you have to dig through, you know, decades of newspapers to try to find one reference to something. Um, so it really, it's, it's hard to know. Um, I'm happy to talk through specifics one-on-one um, -on -one with anybody that wants to, because depending on where you're at, it may, and, and what you're looking at, and what's already been done there, it may, um, that we may be able to give you a better, more specific idea. But there's kind of a lot of factors to be able to really tell you um, anything definitive. Generally, uh, going out in the field, you know, you should be able to spend five or 10 minutes per property out there taking your photos, taking your notes, and then move on. But for somebody that's, that's not familiar with this, it can take a lot longer. Sure, sure. So um, just to clarify, when you say a, a one to two hours, you're saying one to two hours to do like a block and about five to 10 minutes for a... Um, I just mean like to one, that would be to do your field, like on one property, to do your field work, come back, fill out the form, get your photos in, Go, do all of the st all of the things that you need to do for one property. Okay. So like if you're going to go out and, and photograph, you know, a whole block of buildings, it may take you, you know, an hour to go out and photograph the buildings, but then you also have to do your, you have to take notes, you have to come back and fill out your forms. So th there's, there's additional time in there um, beyond just going out and taking the, the photos is, are generally the quickest part of it, of all of this, unless it's a really challenging um, property to photograph, so. Right, um, Katie, have you known of communities who have um, worked with like local historical societies and libraries to identify resources that would make it easier for volunteers to complete like a history of the building, um, just to take some of that responsibility off of a volunteer effort? Um, so yes, 
Clarkson is working on it right now. Um, I've been working with them for probably six or seven months on a volunteer led survey of their historic district. So they already have a historic district and but but um, their district paperwork was done so long ago that that every property is not mentioned in it. Um, like we do now, like now when we do a, a National Register nomination for a district, every single, we, we at least know what every single property is and what it, you know, what it, when it was built, if possible, and, and a basic description of it. Um, in the 70s and 80s, that was not the case. So a lot of communities will find that they have a, uh, they have a historic, they have a National Register nomination and their, their community is on the National Register or, or they have a local district, but there's not uh, information on every property included in those documents. And that can cause a lot of trouble for particularly local districts when there's not an assessment of contributing and non-contributing for every property. So a lot of communities in, in the last few years have started coming forward and asking for um, or, or, or conducting surveys on their own to try to figure out uh, what each, you know, document every single building. Um, so, yeah, I, hopefully, hopefully that helps ish. Yeah, yes. Um, so we don't have any open questions, so I'll let you continue. Okay. okay. Um, we're just going to quickly look at the landscape form. The landscape form is probably the most complicated um, because it asks, it, it uses cultural landscape. That there, are, there is a separate field to study cultural landscapes. Um, and it uses a lot of the language from that. So a community, a volunteer led effort is gonna probably struggle a little bit with this form more so than the other ones. Um, I'm happy to help walk through it. I, I walked Clarkston through it not that long ago um, and try to help them figure out what they need to, what kind of information they need to provide uh, on this form. So same sort of things in the, in the overview. We just wanna know what it is and where it's at. Um, and then you're gonna to have to figure out what kind of landscape this is. Um, is this a historic design landscape, like a design um, garden? Is this um, a historic vernacular, uh, an example of a historic vernacular landscape would be like a farmstead with the farm lane and some of the other landscape features uh, that, that still remain uh, or the field, field configurations that still remain. Um, so the, the, there, there are very specific definitions, again, in some of the National Park Service uh, bulletins that can be really helpful for people to um, read if they have something that is gonna require them to use the cultural landscape form. Um, here's some examples of some types. There are gonna be other things that fit into this category, but we've tried to, to get the majority of them um, onto here. Same kind of thing on this as the previous ones. We're looking at eligibility. Um, it got split between two pages, so it's a little funky looking. Um, and then we're gonna wanna look at everything. We wanna look at the topography, the vegetation, bodies of water, um, the geology of the area, the ecology of the area, the climate, because those all play into whatever landscape we have. Um, how do people use this property? For example, if it's a, if it's a park, are there, um, picnic tables or you know is this a is this a park with docks where people can fish and those kinds of things um, it's really going to depend on what the individual property is but how are how is vegetation planted is are there you know pathways that have planted veg vegetation on either side of them um, are there fences that that bound this property in um, spatial organization, how do people move through the park or, you know, is there one entrance where somebody, you know, that's where everyone comes in and then they move through this park in one particular way. Um, are there building structures or objects in this park? If yes, then you are going to need to go in and fill out the, the uh, identification form for structures or objects, building structures or objects. Um, are there small scale elements like statues or markers or uh, other site furnishings like uh, benches and that sort of thing? Um, what other, and then, and then we ask for more ephemeral qualities like are there sounds that you can hear? Are there different activities happening? Are there wildlife that, are, that, that frequent this area? Um, so we're kind of looking at a little bit different stuff in this form than when we're looking at the individual um, the 
the individual properties and buildings themselves. And then these again are the same thing as the other forms. We're just looking for history and then a statement of significance. So this is all serving as your narrative description. You don't have to necessarily write something. Um, and then we want a site plan, photographs, and then a, a GIS locational information. Um, G GIS is Geographic Information Systems. We're trying, we have a database that I think Diane is somewhere listening. Diane Toonstra in our office is in charge of this. Um, we're working on um, populating that and making sure that we can get whatever we can into it. So if you can provide us information, um, we can put it into our database and, and that helps us get better information to give out to people. So those are kind of the forms. Um, we're going to go back to this quickly. I think there's a couple more questions I saw pop up too. Yes. Do you want to address them now or wait until the end? Um, I can, we can do them now. Um, oh. Backtrack, building form. Yes, that's absolutely, those are forms. So that's absolutely okay to write that, to write rectangular or square, um, it, depending on whatever the situation. You can also write irregular if it's an irregular footprint. Um, so. So Katie, just in case other people, um, the question was regarding building form, if the building is symmetrical pertaining to a certain shape, is it okay to write down rectangular or square form? And as Katie said, yes. Um, and then the next one is uh, your personal opinion, Katie, as the survey coordinator, if you had your wish, how often should, be, how often should we be resurveying? Considering that a survey done 10 years ago might well have found mid-century modern buildings to be non-contributing, a survey done today would be quite different considering the 50-year rule. Um, yep. So we generally recommend that people survey things that are 40 years and older in their survey area. Um, that gives your survey some longevity. It, it, it won't be out of date for 10 years. Um, you know, in an ideal world with unlimited budgets, everyone would survey every 10 years or every five years um, or every year, depending, you know, because then property building conditions are going to change every single day um, or and every year. So in an ideal world with unlimited budgets, it would be great to be able to get out there every single year and, and really see how these properties change. That's probably not realistic, um, but the 40, surveying things that are 40 years old and older will really help your survey have some longevity. So that's our general recommendation. Interesting, that's a good recommendation. All right, thank you. Get rid of those. Okay, so in terms of your report format, um, I'll try to go quick through this because it's kind of, dry and boring, but um, you're basically going to want to come up with a report. There, there, there is no perfect report format out there. We have a suggested format in our um, survey manual. It's going to get edited and changed and, and hopefully if I can get to it in the next few months. Um, but base, we want the basic information that you're collecting. So we want, why are you doing this? What did you do? How did you do it? Um, limitations on your survey, like was were you limited to, you know, you had three months to do it and it was in the middle of winter and you were limited in that you couldn't get photos without snow in them or those kinds of things. Um, we also want to know about what you found. What were the, um, what were the eligibility recommendations for a given area? Um, what kind of background information can you provide to us about not only the survey area, but the project itself? How did this whole thing kind of develop? The, the thing to keep in mind when you're when you're writing a survey report is that this is not gonna just be used by you. This is gonna be used by anybody and everybody that comes into our office or, or your community and, and wants to know more about your community. So making sure that, that this doesn't live in a vacuum and it makes sense to other people uh, and, and they can understand kind of how this happened and why this happened and when this happened. Um, we also are going to want historic context. We did talk quite a bit about that in the last webinar, um, but historic context is not just regurgitating the history. It's, it's really ana analyzing what was going on and, and what else was going, going on around the area. So you really need to be able to um, provide that for a survey area. And then the other thing too is that we're going to need recommendations for future survey work um, or planning needs and recommendations. So these are all items that can go into your report. Um, 
and I want to make sure my I always encourage communities to try to make it something that is going to be useful. We don't want this to just sit on a shelf. Um, and you know, we use it for one specific purpose, but that doesn't mean that it, it, it can't also be useful and pretty and nice to look at with your for your community. Um, one other big thing that we want to talk about briefly is mapping. Um, mapping can be particularly problematic because it may make sense, the same sort of thing that we talked about. It may make sense to you and, and you may know exactly what you surveyed, but if we can't, if, if, if a stranger couldn't come off the street and review this and say, oh, okay, this makes sense. I can see exactly where they surveyed. I can see where the eligible properties are, where the not eligible properties are. It's not very useful for the future. Um, so in general, we, we generally ask people to make things that are reproducible without color copying. So using other things on your map, um, like hash mark, different kinds of hash marks or different kinds of, of things. This, we currently have color copiers in our offices, but we have not always had them. So um, we also wanna make sure that you identify uh, boundaries of your survey area. And, and if there's, I think one thing that gets, that folks get confused on a lot of times is that the boundaries of your survey area and the boundaries of a historic district that you may identify are not always gonna be the same thing. So you may survey an entire neighborhood and find out that, okay, the southern half of this neighborhood was developed at a different time, even though it, it currently appears to be a, a one neighborhood, um, but it was developed in a separate time and, and none of those houses are, are contributing. So your, your historic district boundary would be different than your survey boundary. Um, base maps are really, really important. We are gonna want to make sure that you can choose a base map that, can act, that adequately conveys the location to whoever's looking at the report. Um, aerial photographs can be useful, but they are not, um, they can't generally be the only type of map you send us because that is not, we, we need to have street names, we need to have things that kind of help orient um, the, the survey area into the, um, into the rest of the community. Um, we want cross streets labeled. This is a major problem. People won't label cross streets and then it takes us forever to try to figure out where on earth the survey took place. Um, the other thing too is that multiple maps may be necessary. Um, we also encourage folks to provide copies of historic maps, include historic maps in your survey report. Um, those can be really useful in kind of illustrating how a, a community or a um, neighborhood changed over time, Sanborn maps or plat maps and that sort of thing. So we do encourage that as well. Those don't generally um, replace, you know, your, your modern map that shows us what you surveyed, but they can be a really good uh, tool to be able to illustrate some of your points. Um, and then, so for complex or multi-phase, some communities choose to phase their projects. So they'll survey you know, one, the northeast quadrant of their city, and then the next year they'll do the northwest quadrant. Um, if you're gonna do that and you wanna look at that, be sure to talk to myself and Diane Tunstra, who's our historic inventory and records coordinator, to try to create a plan for the mapping. We have found that our multi-phase survey report mapping is incredibly lacking. And it makes it really, really challenging to try to make sense of, of all of these reports once we get them. Um, so make sure if you have, if you want to phase your project, there's nothing wrong with it. Just make sure you talk to us ahead of time and we can help you get a plan for how to, how to adequately map that. Um, we are almost done. Other notes, um, like I said, please incorporate photos and maps. There's nothing worse than getting a survey report that doesn't have a single photo or a single map throughout the report. Um, they really do help them help make them more interesting. It helps to illustrate your points. Um, you don't, you know, then have to flip through to the back page and try to find the whatever map they're talking about when they're when they're discussing something in a report. Um, make them user friendly for your community. Make it something that your community can actually use and that property owners could say, hey look, this is the information I have on my property. Um, and then the other thing too is that don't forget that you, there's nothing that says that you can't incorporate information that will be useful for your specific project in your specific community. Um, like we talked about on the forms, the parcel number doesn't mean anything to us, but if that's gonna make it easier to track in your, for your municipality, 
feel free to add it. Go ahead. It's not going to, it doesn't bother us. Um, you know, information about street condition or sidewalk condition or trees or any of that kind of stuff that it doesn't bother us for that to be in there. And, and if it's more useful for your community, that's what we, we want this to be useful. So um, I think that's all I've got about reports. I think I saw a couple of questions maybe. Okay, I can answer um, Janet's real quick. So are there upper limits to the dimensions of what you submit as hard copy? Does everything need to fit into a filing cabinet or in a Hollander box? Um, yes, <laughs> everything needs to, to fit into, if, if you wanna have 11 by 17 maps, they need to be folded up into a uh, eight and a half by 11 sized report. So we have, if you've ever been to our office, we have a gigantic, uh, room full of surveys uh, from all over Michigan uh, and they go on the sh they, it's bookshelves and they go on the bookshelf with all of the rest of them. So um, it makes our lives a lot easier if they fit uh, like a normal report would. So that's kind of the, the uh, general rule of thumb. Excellent. And then you, you mostly answered the other one that came in regarding a, a volunteer led effort completing a quarter of a of a survey every year and you already addressed, um, you know, talking to you going over what would be needed in order to make that um, a productive use. And have a, a usable survey at the end of that process. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, if you if you need to phase your survey. Um, you know, feel free to just contact us and I, I'm happy to talk through the best way to do that and the best way to, to try to figure out, you know, to be efficient and to get what you need. Um, you know, there, it, the Kalamazoo example is an extreme, they, this is an extremely ambitious plan um, that I give Sharon a lot of credit for, for undertaking because it's a huge, it's a huge undertaking. Um, generally, the, it's much, much, much more common to, to select a small area to survey than it is to have the entire community surveyed. So um, don't feel pressure that you have to get it done immediately. Uh, it's, it's, it just depends on the individual community. All right. Um, so if uh, you have any questions, feel free to type them in. We don't have any open right now. Um, but Katie, I guess in our conversations that we've been having um, with the last webinar and this webinar today, um, my takeaway is, you know, if you're going to start a community survey, uh, reach out to you or the SHPO office and in order to help um, create a plan um, to allow for a successful survey process. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's, it helps to, um, it helps to get us involved early on in the process because we can help you avoid some of the common pitfalls that, that we often see communities um, falling into. So it really does help to talk to us. I swear we're super friendly. Um, normally we travel a ton and we would be happy to come out to your community. Right now we are not um, allowed to travel, but we are happy to set up a, a video chat. Um, like I mentioned, I did do a video chat with Clarkston's group that they're working with and we walked through every part of the form and we answered very specific questions about buildings in their district and I'm happy to do that. Um, you may see my children running around in those kinds of calls because it's, it's occasionally difficult to get them out of the house for that but um, yeah I'm happy to, to help in any way that I can. So. Excellent. So we did have another question come in. Um, is the SHPO office working on um, porting these forms to the ARC survey soft, software or any other, um, you know, software program? <laughs> this is Diane's worst nightmare <laughs> of a question right in a second. So, um, we, the short answer is not right now. I think that in an ideal world, absolutely, that would be the direction that we're going to. It's, it's where we want to be. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, we, I don't have a problem with folks using any of the existing survey apps that are out there as long as you're collecting the information that we need onto our forms. Um, it is possible to set up, I know that some of our consultants that, that do work um, on a lot of surveys will 
use those survey apps, then it gets exported to an Excel file. Then they use that Excel file to create a mail merge with the forms and, and, and kind of automate it that way. Um, so that's one kind of time saving method. And, and I am reasonably competent at, at walking people through the mail merge process if you need help. It's not terribly difficult, but um, so I, I, that's one way to kind of automate the process right now. And we are hoping that we can get there at some point. Uh, it's just, my guess is it's not gonna happen anytime soon, so. Sure, sure, it's a process, right? We're all, we're all doing our processes right now. Yes, yes, very much so. <laughs> Um, so one more question. Um, you mentioned you'll help communities strategize and plan for things through conversation. Um, do you also do hands-on training for survey, i.e. how to photograph a building? Um, and I will quickly say the MHPN does offer a training for how to research your old property. Um, and we've also done trainings um, talking through different styles. Um, so, right, the difference between the form and the style, and we'll, we'll walk through the common styles that you might find in Michigan. Um, and then I also know, Katie, I'll let you respond with what SHPO offers. Yeah, so we generally are pretty hands-on. And like I said, this is kind of a weird time for us because we aren't traveling and we're, we're all, gen most of us are still working from home. So, um, Generally, the answer would be yes. I don't know when that's going to be available again. I don't know when. We're not sure. Um, it kind of depends on how things are going with all of this craziness. Um, I think that one option for folks is that, uh, and I think Alan probably mentioned it in his webinar, but on the certified local governments, but um, Alan has started a program for certified local governments that has a very intensive educational component for surveys and National Register nominations and then also um, creating design guidelines. So he's, he is um, specifically for CLGs, he's offering um, a, a kind of a competitive program to be able to go out and do a couple of these projects with a community um, every year. Uh, this was the first year that he was that he was doing it and and obviously his uh, efforts have been a little bit stifled by COVID but I, I think he's hopeful that he'll have those done by the end of the year. Um, it's just going to look a little different than what it normally would because normally we would be right there with you walking through the neighborhood. Um, so yes we are happy to help in any way that we can. Right now it it probably has to be over Zoom or Teams or some other digital platform um, but Hopefully, my guess is, you know, next summer we may be able to get back out and start um, walking people through things in a, in a more hands-on way. Excellent. Hopefully. Fingers I, crossed. <laughs> very much so. Um, a plug for our next webinar on September 3rd. Um, it's going over architectural terms, and we will be using some of these forms to go through um, you know, the different types of roof styles so you can uh, know, um, you know the difference between a gable, uh, a gambrel, um, an empire, and all those other types of terms that uh, a volunteer, uh, a volunteers might need to learn. So do register for that. Again, all of our webinars um, in this series are being recorded and being put on our YouTube channel. So if you can't join us live, um, I hope you'll check it out there. And if you have questions from any of the webinars, feel free to reach out to myself or any of the presenters, um, particularly our SHPO uh, staff have been so great in uh, participating and, and presenting during these webinars. And I know they'd be happy to, to hear from you and answer any questions you have. So Absolutely. I hope you'll join us on the third. <laughs> yep, and, and feel free to call me. I do, obviously I am, I'm not on the porch of the Grand Hotel as much as I may wish that I was. <laughs> Um, but we're all working from home, but we are all checking our voicemails and getting voicemails and we're happy to talk on the phone um, or, or whatever so, or via email. Excellent. Um, well, we haven't had any new questions come in. Um, so I, I guess, Katie, do you have any um, comments that you would like to end on before we wrap up the webinar? No, just don't be intimidated. It seems like it's a lot and uh, uh, it, it can be, but it, you know, take it small pieces at a time and, and maybe just start practicing and take one out and, and do your own house, do a form on your own house just to get comfortable with the forms. Um, it can be really interesting to find out what you can, what you can learn and, uh, and, and things that you may notice about your house or your neighbor's house that you never, that you never knew. So 
um, don't be intimidated and feel free to reach out. We're happy to help. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much for your time today, Katie, and sharing your, your knowledge. Um, we're, again, thankful to the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs for helping um, support these webinars. And I hope that they have been helpful for you as well. Um, the goal really is to help um, communities plan for preservation and um, execute their goals, whether it's through a consultant, whether it's through volunteer efforts. So if you have any questions, again, reach out to Katie or myself. Um, you can find my uh, email at www.mhpn.org. Um, so I hope you'll register for our next webinars. Again, uh, September 3rd, we're going over architectural terms, specifically using the survey um, forms. And then on September 17th, we'll be joined by Dave Deppi. Uh, he will be going over wood windows and energy efficiency. So if you have any questions about that, um, we hope you'll join us. Additionally, our conference has gone virtual this year. Um, it's September 21st through the 22nd. Registration is now open and you can find more information at our website. Uh, cost for both days unlimited access is $125 or $75 for students and seniors. And additionally, we do have scholarship opportunities. If you would like more information on that, that's also on our website. So we uh, hope you all have a wonderful day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck with all of your preservation pro uh, projects that you have uh, underway at this moment. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you again.